the evidence and the science has accumulated so powerfully, especially in the last five years, that uh, nicotine vaping is substantially less harmful than smoking. And for many, many smokers who are just unable or frankly don't want to stop using nicotine but don't want to die from the smoke, this is a very encouraging statement in the right direction because our ultimate goal is to save smokers' lives from the debilitating diseases that come from burning the tobacco in smoke, not from the much less harmful vape. So it's encouraging, but doesn't go far enough. Now, uh, uh, Julie, you, um, you know, obviously the work uh, that you do with, with INCO and, and the consumer organizations, um, you know, they've obviously been pushing for things like this. How, you know, what is, how do you see this specific report coming out of the European office sort of comparing to the overall language that the WHO is, has had in the past? And, and how are these organizations, you know, outside of the United States in particular, sort of uh, taking this news? I, I think there's some cautious optimism. Um, certainly the European regional office is in a different um, situation. They're largely operating under the TPD. Um, so there is some regulation, there is the presence of electronic cigarettes, and so they're able to see, I think, the health benefits. Um, in other countries, we've got outright bans and such. So, you know, the hope is that this cautious optimism that we're getting from the report will filter out through other regions and certainly up to the higher levels of the WHO. But that's just not at all clear, you know, what's going to happen from there. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Abrams or, or Dr. Nayara, I would love if you can, you know, you mentioned a little bit about how this does not go quite far enough. Um, can you sort of speak to some of the research that you have seen? You know, this report does mention some, you know, they they mentioned that there is less health risks. However, they they definitely stop short of saying that this can be used as a as an opportunity or these products can be used to be able to quit um, or or in the, you know, helping somebody quit. Can you sort of speak to the research that you have seen or participated in that that does show that that can be the case? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, uh, take the first uh, pass on this. Um, so, you know, the, the, the party line has been that, you know, these, these products um, theoretically could be safer than smoking cigarettes, but it hasn't been proven. And, and uh, you know, it would take, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 years of study to demonstrate this. And so therefore we can't take the risk. But in fact, uh, we know at this point, we know an awful lot of about these products. Now, not all the products are the same and, and some are probably safer than others, but in terms of, you know, well-manufactured, well-regulated products, we, we have pretty strong uh, biological data showing that, you know, all the, all the biomarkers of risk associated with, uh, with smoking tobacco, burning tobacco are uh, dramatically, and I mean dramatically reduced when uh, people switch from smoking to using, um, you know, uh, reduced risk products, e-cigarettes in particular. So, I, I mean, that, you know, and this is a consistent finding. And I'm not talking about the animal studies, which have their own set of problems. But if we look at human biological studies, um, it's, it's the evidence is, in my opinion, at least pretty overwhelming um, that we're seeing, you know, dramatic, dramatic reductions in these biomarkers of risk. So that, that in and of itself tells me that, um, you know, that there's the safety profile has to be looking pretty good. Now, yes, we do need, you know, ongoing research and of, of course, um, and we need to keep, you know, monitoring these things, but I think we're, you know, we're off to a good start. What's surprising is to me is that people, you know, selectively ignore um, this growing body of literature, you know, suggesting that these products are, at least in, in you know, in terms of biological potential, pretty safe. Um, and it's hard to imagine what it would take to convince skeptics, but the evidence is there if you want to look for it. 
Dr. Abrams, I would love to ask you a, a question um, in particular. You know, when when we look at this scientific, you know, we look at we look at the data, we look at the research reports. There is, you know, I didn't really notice anything in this brief speaking at all about stigma, about how you know maybe somebody being labeled as a smoker um, has you know could have negative effects over the course of of somebody's life. Can can you speak a little bit um, about that and when it comes to an overall, you know, sort of the the helping somebody stop smoking who wants to stop smoking? At what point does that come in more than just the products themselves? You know, as a clinician who's actually helped smokers to switch or quit um, and also dealt with other stigmatized behaviors like mental illness or substance abuse, um, we have known now for years that that stigma is the major, major barrier that prevents some people from coming to get the help they need or um, people thinking there's something inherently wrong with them if they can't have the willpower to stop smoking. And um, they get down on themselves and they have a very negative self-image, which is uncalled for and completely sad. Because the truth is that, um, you know, we're all humans and we all have our strengths and weaknesses. And that stigma, I think, both prevents smokers from getting uh, to a point where they might say, well, I might need nicotine for the rest of my life, but I don't have to smoke cigarettes to get it. So this extreme of all or nothing, you have to quit everything to stop this quote addiction to nicotine is also a big barrier to people getting to be able to substitute a much cleaner and better form of nicotine delivery that um, may be beneficial to them and yet they label themselves as you know having weak willpower or something wrong with them um, so it prevents both harm reduction of saying well, you know, I, I would ideally like to not use anything at all, but, you know, I'd much rather use a less harmful product than a much more harmful product like smoking. All of that ties into stigma and becomes a major barrier to saving their own lives, um, being there for their loved ones and family for many more years with better quality of life saving a lot of money and frankly that then ladders up to uh, a billion lives lost unnecessarily in the whole world in the next century if we don't remove the stigma and help people who don't want to quit to switch to less harmful products it, it's so common sense and obvious but that stigma can be a major barrier to people getting uh, to a point where they feel comfortable using nicotine without smoke or um, trying to come for help because it's hard to admit that they need, they can't do this alone. This may be a, a little bit of a um, elementary question, uh, but if, if we do have that, you know, if we do have that, that research out there, like really showing what that stigma can do, you know, for an organization like the WHO, what do you think the disconnect is there, but with not embracing that research and, and instead going on, you know, more of a, a prohibitionist or sort of quit or die stance. They, they, they do pay attention to harm reduction issues and have made statements in favor of harm reduction in other areas with respect to injection drug use and, and uh, sexual activity and so forth. Um, uh, but yet they, you know, there's very little, uh, you know, evidence of kind of a similar compassionate perspective and approach when it when it comes to, to tobacco um, and and it's it's hard to explain that that disconnect um, you know it's kind of like you know they've got it right in in certain ways and then completely wrong in in with respect to tobacco and you know how, how do we how do we explain that how do we deal with it uh, go go ahead David um, I agree and I think um... You know, there's always been a resistance to harm reduction traditionally and historically until it's shown to save many, many lives. 
I mean, there was opposition to things like needle sharing or ways to reduce, you know, deaths due to opioid overdoses until it, it was shown that, that actually, you know, not only this saves lives, but it provides a certain amount of respect for a human being who might not be doing the things you would have to be treated like a human being. Um, and I think WHO has, has lost its compass with respect to smoking alone, as opposed to the harm reduction that they do with things like condom use and prevention of HIV AIDS, as, as Ray was saying. And, and it is puzz puzzling and troubling. And I think some of it is that they have been unduly and strongly influenced by uh, a narrative coming from essentially a group that was formed when we didn't have alternative products where it was pretty clear that in fact all you could do was smoke and if you smoked um, you couldn't separate the nicotine from the lethal smoke and therefore prohibition seemed to be an okay thing to recommend for quote tobacco control which really meant smoking control but now that we have a variety of products, I think um, they've been very slow to see the science. And, and there is a group of people that are well-funded and have very loud and credible voices that have continued to push a prohibition stance against smoking when it didn't work for alcohol and harm reduction is clearly the way to go in, in many areas. So. You know, I, I wish the WHO would step back and look at the, the whole science, not selectively exaggerate some science and omit other science to promote an ideological prohibitionist message. Yes. And, and Julie, I would, I would love if you can, you know, you obviously have, uh, you know, a, an experience working right on the ground with, you know, the you know, the, the consumers that are using these products. And, you know, we've heard some of those stories. I would love if you can just share a, a little bit, you know, sort of speaking to the points that we have about stigma with, with the consumers of these products. I, I think stigma is, you know, as, as David said, just a huge barrier to people getting the help um, that they need to improve their lives and their health. But, you know, another issue that we've got in addition to stigma is misinformation. And we've got a lot of people out there who actually believe that using electronic cigarettes is more dangerous than smoking, at least as dangerous, if not more dangerous. And, you know, this is misinformation that's being perpetuated, um, not simply by the media, but also by some trusted organizations. And I don't know whether it's by design or, or carelessness, but you know, if people don't understand that there are alternatives, if they are stigmatized so that they don't even try, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge public health disaster and it's a failure. Um, and people's lives are on the line. I, I think sometimes the people at these high rarefied levels are looking at numbers and policies and they kind of forget that behind all of that are real people with real lives and real stories. And um, we don't forget, we don't forget that. And we believe that consumers should be considered stakeholders in this, um, Whole arena and traditionally we have not been so but in any event I agree that stigmatization, stigmatization is a terrible um, barrier terrible thing and the misinformation yes um, dr. Nair, I wanted to ask you a question you know right right at the top you you know as you said half joking that somebody somebody may get in trouble uh, for this so you know with, with, with your experience of sort of seeing how the WHO works seeing how you know, this research specifically in this topic, uh, do you think that this could be a sign of, you know, maybe the overall organization taking some, uh, you know, diving further down this road? Uh, or do you think that, you know, we might have more of the status quo? It's hard to say. I mean, you know, this is again, a, you know, a positive indication, but, um, you know, the track record so far with respect to tobacco harm reduction 
ha has not been good. And it, and it gets back to the issue that, uh, that Julie raised about misinformation. There, you know, yes, a lot of it is probably, you know, not necessarily intentional, but a lot of it is intentional. And, and unfortunately, um, it, it comes in various ne nefarious forms. I mean, it's one thing to sort of say, oh, you know, these products are bad for you. They're, they're worse than uh, cigarettes, which is, you know, ludicrous. But w when you ha actually have, you know, groups of scientists or individual scientists who, who basically sometimes, um, you know, com commit fr fraud or, you know, more, more charitably, uh, you know, twist uh, evidence and data in favor of, of the hypothesis that these products are worse than cigarettes. That's a real problem. And people, yes, at, at, at other levels, at higher levels, don't have the capacity, the wherewithal, the expertise to, to be able to sort through the, the truth from the, from the falsehoods. And this is a real, you know, ongoing problem that, um, you know, the, uh, scientists in, in this in this space, in this area, are, are having to contend with. And it's, it's very troubling. It's, it's, it, and it takes an awful lot of work and effort to push back against, um, you know, you know, the, the, the scientific, you know, fraud and misconduct that, um, that unfortunately, we're, we're encountering all the time. So I guess the, the the question that I would like to you know po pose to all of you is you know for our viewers out there, you know what what can they sort of do to help you know wade through this this misinformation uh, this um, you know the the funding sources that we have we're not sure exactly where they're coming from or maybe we have an idea where they're coming from that are you know spinning certain narratives. What what would you suggest for somebody who's who's just watching this? How can they be better informed? and then pass that information on to their to their loved ones well you know the question is what you know what are the trusted sources of information and typically you know we rely on on our governments our government agencies which generally speaking have served us pretty well here in the u.s we have you know the centers for disease control the national institutes of health the food and drug administration um so normally I would say, you know, these are the sources that, that we need to consult. Um, but, 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 even, but even then we, we still run into trouble because there's so much, you know, interference happening. Um, so it's a, it's a real quandary. Um, I, I, I think, you know, my general rule of thumb nowadays is to tell people not to, not necessarily believe everything on the first pass, but to look for consistency of, of information, to look at corroboration, um, you know, if you find that there are, you know, vastly opposing differences of opinion on the topic, that should be a red flag that, you know, you need to do more research and you need to, you know, ask the questions, um, you know, what's going on here? Why am I not getting a consistent story? Um, there's always going to be, you know, legitimate questions, things that we don't know about. But then there are things that we do know about, and there, and you know, we should always, you know, seek out trusted sources. It's, it's a, you know, and 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 these days, I mean, the world has gone crazy with, you know, information technology, social media. It's it's harder than ever to sort through the the wheat from the from the chaff. I don't know if that's a good answer to. You to your question. Um, but you know, it, it's just people have to really be vigilant uh, and talk about these things, be transparent, you know, transparent about what you know, what you don't know, um, transparent about your support, your funding sources. Um, you know, all of it, all of that needs to be put out front uh, so that people can at least have an honest conversation about these issues. Yes, that actually yeah, leads right add, well into. Oh yes, yes, please, please, Dr. Abrams. So just to try to be quick, but um, consider the source, and I would also add to that: be really careful here, because the 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 common wisdom is that if you don't like the message, shoot the messenger, and often that's been 
oh, there's some funding from the tobacco industry or the so-called evil big tobacco companies. Now, sometimes that's true and you should take with a grain of salt some of the either research or other things. However, I think it's equally now plausible that the source of funding and the source of information may be biased into being anti-harm reduction, anti-vaping, and, and, and be as extreme and as lucrative in getting the money to give a prohibition message. So consider the source could also be, are there biases when you see extreme statements from anti-harm reductionists where you know the science just doesn't support what they're saying. So I would be skeptical on all sides, not just make it easy to say, oh, that's coming from the tobacco industry, automatically it's gotta be bad. Um, and so that's one other thing. But also I'd like to say, don't trust isolated extreme papers and be really careful. I think there are some very responsible synthesis of all the bodies of knowledge by very respectable organizations. And I would name three. One is Public Health England that has done the most comprehensive, objective, strongest science method reviews and updates its work almost every year. And I have not seen a, a more strong and rigorous approach to what we know and honestly what we don't know. So I would trust Public Health England across the world as having the biggest synthesis of all the information in an accurate manner, in my opinion. Then there's the Royal College of Physicians, which is equally prestigious and has been around for 400 years to be sure that science is done right. Um, the, the American National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine is another body that if you read carefully their actual report, not the executive summary and the spin of that summary in the media, but the original reviews of each chapter, they basically say the evidence is strongest, the strongest level of evidence that e-cigarettes are substantially less harmful than cigarettes overall, and that they can help adult smokers quit. And they never ever say that it's a massive gateway to smoking among teens either. They simply say there's an association between ever using an e-cigarette and ever using a cigarette or, or one in the last 30 days. There is no evidence at all that they state or Public Health England that there's a massive gateway from e-cigarettes to regular daily smoking. So if you look at the actual data, it's really solid and it comes from three trusted sources. Um, an example, there was a big set of news media that e-cigarettes cause more heart attacks than cigarettes. And I don't know if anybody noticed, but in the last two months, that study was retracted by the Journal of the American Heart Association as being unreliable. In fact, they counted heart attacks that occurred before the people started using e-cigarettes. And yet that is being used around the world to say e-cigarettes are as harmful or more harmful than cigarettes without noticing that that study has been retracted. So again, I agree with Ray, but I would say there are trusted sources and they tend to be comprehensive reviews by august bodies, not isolated studies. It's wonderful. Now, it's, it's, you actually answered the question before I could ask it. We had a question from, from YouTube that was asking about, you know, different sources that, you know, can point to what, you know, the, the message that, that you all are, are sharing. And, you know, specifically about that, you know, retracted study, we, we did cover that. That was one of the first stories that we, uh, we covered with our most, uh, most recent uh, section of tobacco harm reduction updates here with Vita News. So I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I could be able to speak with you three all day. We could do this for for hours. Um, however, I do want to, you know, keep this broadcast uh, close. I hope to be able to have you all on again soon. Uh, but I do want to give each of you uh, just an opportunity 
Um, you know, obviously we do have, you know, there's a lot of news and a lot of buzz around things like World No Tobacco Day, which is coming up, which as we've had a, on, in this conversation, you know, some of that compass, that North Star has been lost and it seems to be shifting more to prohibition of these devices rather than, you know, for the issues that, that we have discussed. So, you know, I would, I would love to just give each of you just a moment if there's anything else that you would like to be able to share with our, our audiences, any uh, parting thoughts um, for any of these topics. And Julia, I think we can start with you. Um, well, so May 31st is World No Tobacco Day, um, but more importantly for tobacco harm reduction advocates, um, May 30th is World Vape Day. And there's actually a website, um, worldvapeday.org, and consumer organizations from across the globe have joined together, and we're gonna be sharing our success stories and sharing positive messaging um, surrounding the use of vaping as a tobacco harm reduction alternative. And, you know, it's very important that, that vapers participate um, and there are instructions on how to do it at World Vape Day. But, you know, I, I think the one thing I would like to say in, in parting is, you know, the discussion about trusted sources, a related point to that is the erosion now of public trust among certainly the active vaping community in sources that we should be able to trust. And because they have gotten it so very, very badly wrong on a subject that we as consumers are quite expert on, it leads people to question their um, judgment in other things, which is very unfortunate because I don't think that they get everything wrong. I think they're quite right on some issues. And, you know, so there's a there's a real cost to these, these credible organizations um, that aren't playing fair with vapor products. Um, and the cost is people just won't trust them for anything. And that is a, a huge cost. Thank you. Dr. Noyera. Um, yeah, so, you know, we've all heard the saying, if something's too good to be true, it probably isn't true. Well, the corollary to that, if something is too bad to be true, it also probably isn't true. And, and I, you know, I'd just like to emphasize that nobody has a monopoly on the truth, and including scientists, including government bodies and government officials and, and you know, non-government organizations like the World Health Organization. So, you know, be skeptical ask questions, persist uh, until you are satisfied that you're getting to the bottom of things. Don't accept anything at face value, especially in, in, in this area. Um, I know that's hard, um, but you know, we've got to you know, move ahead. And the only way to do that is if we're transparent with our knowledge and our, our lack of knowledge and open with our questions. Thank you. Dr. Abrams. So I would say context is everything. And if messages are displayed out of context, that's how propaganda and misinformation is conveyed. And there are two ways that that's done. Errors of omission, where you don't say the whole story, but you don't completely lie. There's a particle of truth. And errors of commission, where you massively exaggerate a real harm, which is also not a lie, but makes it far worse than it is. So I would watch out for both of those in everything that you read and look at. The biggest omission is to not directly compare a nicotine or vape product with toxic tobacco smoke. So for example, you will see someone say, you know, vapes has chemicals in the aerosol and the flavor, and therefore it's not harmless. It's got some things in it that are not good for you. They'll stop there. And that leads many consumers to say, well, it must be as harmless as toxic tobacco smoke. They don't add, but those toxins are at trace levels and most of them won't cause human harm, 
and it's 98% or 92% or 95% less harmful than cigarettes. So you, you should always look at a statement that compares the relative harm of the product with the toxic smoke and harm of a cigarette, not compare it with just nothing or leave out the comparison with the cigarette. And the exaggeration is obvious and comes from the omission, which is you can then exaggerate the harm, um, let's say of vaping. And, and the bottom line here is the biggest myth of all that needs to be corrected is that nicotine is not the source of harm either heart disease can or pulmonary disease. It's not harmless, obviously, it's a chemical but it is not the primary source of harm. Nicotine doesn't cause cancer. It's the toxic smoke and at least 69 carcinogenic chemicals in the burnt smoke that cause the cancer. So those two things alone, it, it's almost common sense. If you don't burn it, how could it be as harmful as heating it, warming it and, and inhaling it? So relative harm relative to cigarettes and watch out for errors of omission, not saying the whole story and commission, exaggerating the small harms that you do want to exaggerate. All of that leads to prohibition out of context. Yes, context is key. Thank you again to our panelists, uh, Julie Wassner, Dr. Raymond Nayura, Dr. David Abrams, thank you so much. I look forward to having you all on the broadcast again very soon.